This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More on them later. And I guess the other really memorable shift was I turned up and it was a, I started at, I think, 5 a.m. And I was told, oh, well, you're going to be controlling the telescope today. Um, so <laughs> um, that was a, a bit uh, unexpected at the start. So In all the hype around those first five science images being released from the James Webb Space Telescope, people seem to have forgotten the fact that all the data from that commissioning period when the science teams were essentially aligning and calibrating and just generally getting to know the telescope, all that data was also released. Not only that, but all the people on those science teams who'd been sworn to secrecy for months could finally talk about that commissioning time period. I had so many of my colleagues who were just so excited to just tell people everything about that time, including Dr. Libby Jones from the UK Astronomy Technology Centre, who is a member of the MIRI science team on JWST. MIRI is one of five detectors on board that record the light that the telescope detects. It takes both images and spectra where you take the light from a source and split it into its component wavelengths so you get this nice graph and it does that at mid infrared wavelengths the longest wavelengths detected by the james webb space telescope or jwst and those wavelengths are given off by the coolest objects in space like dust and gas. In order to be able to detect such low wavelengths of light coming from very cool objects, MIRI itself has to be cooled to 7 Kelvin. That's 7 degrees above absolute zero temperature, the lowest temperature there is where molecules are no longer moving anymore. So I had a chat with Dr. Libby Jones about her role on the MIRI science team, what science she's currently doing now she's got her hands on some data from JWST, and what it was like to be in control of the telescope during that commissioning period when she got to see the first images from JWST before anybody else. So I'm an STFC web fellow. Um, I'm involved in research with uh, JWST and also as part of the commissioning team and planning early observations. So I've been involved with web for about eight to ten years now. It's been quite a while. <laughs> What science questions are you trying to answer specifically? I'm looking at the beginning and end of a star's life. So I'm looking at how stars are born in nearby galaxies and how stars die. So I'm looking at supernova 1987A for one instance. And with that, we've thrown basically all the instruments we can get at at it. So both the imaging and spectrograph with MIRI, uh, the NIRCAM IFU spectrograph, and then we're planning follow-up observations uh, in the next cycle so we can get time series data again. Yeah, and time series as well. That's almost like watching it evolve in front of your very eyes. Yeah, so it's it's really exciting because it's currently going through a, a shock. So everything is changing and it, it's a continuously evolving object. So to see uh, the death of a star and potentially the formation of a neutron star or black hole in real time, that's what we hope to get to eventually. This must be such a steep learning curve, like figuring out what JWST can do. Because what is it about JWST that allows you specifically to study, for example, like 1987A? Oh, so something like this, it's having that high resolution view in the mid infrared, um, both with the imager and the spectrograph. So having spectra, at every single point in, in the imager because uh, you have a central core which is the ejector which is actually the, this material produced by the supernova itself and then there's a ring surrounding it of a previous history of material that the, the star before it exploded lost so it's a really really high dynamic range observation you've got a really really bright ring and this really faint ejector together and so you need that sensitivity and spatial resolution together to really see what's going on in this object and we've never been able to do that before so getting those observations was very exciting and they're stunning but spoilers I can't show you what they are yet <laughs> damn it I was hoping for a sneak peek <laughs> but you've had this for a while right that you've seen images of JWST and not been able to tell them about to anybody because you were on the commissioning side of things as well was it just for Miri or was it for a lot of the instruments and, and what was that like yeah so I was on console for Miri um, and we were supporting that in two of us were on shift at some point and we were on there 24 hours a day so we worked some very odd hours yeah um, and so luckily I was there and only started being um on console at the real business end when the images start to be taken some of my colleagues were there right from the start watching just the instruments cool down and shutter movements and all sorts of things like that and so that was quite a long process of keeping very detailed track of just minute changes of temperature but for me it was that we would already taken the first uh telescope alignment images and then 
getting the first MUI data, I was there a week or so after that. So it was all systems go. It was the first time we we're using very different modes, seeing would they work. It was very exciting just to be there and then getting sneak peeks of the data because we could we had access to this. And so we were downloading and while we were on shift, uh, we were processing the data on, on the fly just to see what we were getting. Was it working? What had come back from the telescope? And so you're looking at that and then seeing, oh, is JWST still on that plan? Um, are we doing anything today? Have we got any MUI activities? And then you could hear other people in the room. So then the NERSPEC team were in there, the NERCAM team were in there, all the science operations were in the same room. And so you could, when anything exciting happened or something new happened, you could feel the atmosphere in the room change. And it was really great with people just really engaged with what was happening in everyone's observations. Did you get any sneak peeks of their data as well? Or was it all sort of like, no, you can't see my data yet? <laughs> No, you, you got all sneak peeks. Oh, you basically so got a, a full idea of what was going on. Um, and there was daily briefings, so you knew what was happening with each of the instruments. It was definitely all systems go and lots of hard work with people analysing the data as data was being taken. It, it was uh, quite an intense period and I think very well done by all the commissioning teams to get so much done in such a short space of time. I think that also, just the humans involved. I can't get over just how wonderful everyone is who's been involved in this. Like, yeah, the engineers, the technology, like the mission control people, the full range of everyone, the, the cleaning staff, just everyone is in all part of trying to get everything to work successfully. And it was really nice to be part of that. Do you, was there any particular like standout moments from that time that you think, oh, I can remember that forever? Uh, yeah, there were, there were two, um, I think. One of them was, um, it was a couple of days before, before things go into the schedule, um, you coordinate with the schedule controllers and make sure all the observations are exactly how you want them. And one I remember, I was on shift and everyone was panicking a bit because we're going to observe the first transit spectroscopy with Miri. Mm. Um, so that was an exciting time and just lots of activity ongoing um, with what was, what was happening. Um, and so making sure we got that all planned. And then it happened to be that my next shift was actually when those observations were taking place. Um, so I was on console and then we got the data uh, and it, cause it's quite a short observation. We need to make sure that, oh no, have we got the transit in the middle of the peak? Have we got the beginning and end? Cause there was, there was some delays with some of the previous observations. So that was like, oh no, have we got it? And then it turned out when we downloaded the data, yes, we did not only have we got it, but you could see this transit almost in the raw pipeline produced data wow. without any very little processing. And we're just like, wow, this is so much better than what we've done before. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was a, an absolutely fantastic couple of shifts. And it was just like, wow, we've done this for the first time. This is great. Mm -hmm. And I guess the other really memorable shift was I turned up and it was, a, I started at, I think, 5 a.m. And I was told, oh, well, you're going to be controlling the telescope today. Um, so <laughs> um, that was a, a bit... Uh, unexpected at the start so we were changing um we're uploading some commands to change the speed of a filter wheel and mm -hmm. it was just like yep yeah, now you're in charge of the telescope and so making sure all the commands were going up and the script had mostly been in place but you had to make sure the command was executed one at a time and each stage was painstakingly done and you saw everything being typed real time to the telescope and going yes it was good to go or no wait and make sure that um Miri was doing its thing so they're the two really memorable all systems go shifts uh yeah. that I was on. I still, I, I've controlled telescopes well, on the ground. Obviously, not in space. I've controlled telescopes before, and I know that controlling a telescope means sequence of commands, like on a computer. But in my head, when you said that, I still pictured like this giant joystick that you were just there, like <laughs> controlling the telescope right now. But it, it's not like that at all. Can you sort of describe to people sort of what controlling the telescope entails in terms of like what everything looks like in front of you? Like, is it in a big, like, mission control? Like, Oh, yeah, it was definitely a huge room. Um, so I had, as a personal, I had four massive monitors um, with all the screens you can imagine. So th think of the biggest monitor you can imagine, then four of them in, in um, sort of a console thing, then a headset um, with all where you're talking in your... You, you've got your cheat sheet to talk properly on the headset, like five by five or loud and clear. Um, rather than saying loud and clear and making sure talking to mom and the mission operation control manager. Um, so that's a separate thing. And then you also have your laptop with all the observations coming up. So, so you've got your four massive screens and your laptop. You've got all the data. So where web is pointing, the temperatures, the, the different movements. There's lots and lots of information on screens that you can see what's happening. You can see like the, the, the counts going up on the, your integrations as you're observing. And then, yeah, you have other screens that just show you the commands that are being uploaded to the telescope. So that's what you have in front of you just as standard. And then 
also then these these big screens in the top that show the timelines of what's coming up next, where they're observing, what's happening. And then there's also a screen that's a, an animation of where Webb is pointing. So you can actually see if it's Webb slewing across the sky, you can see it like slewing across the stars in this, <laughs> this sort of animated um, version of Webb as well. So it's possibly as, as technologically advanced as you can imagine, because there were some weird shifts when we're taking the early science observations. And that was... While everything else we knew we knew what was being taken, those early release science. So that was now the the, the big five. So that yeah, the them. big five, the Southern <laughs> Ring Nebula, the deep mm-hmm. field. All of that was being taken while I was on some shifts, but they were just blacked out. And so I, even now, I don't know which ones I was on shift for when some of this data was being taken. So all you could see was um, so if Miri was observing, it was Miri ERO mm-hmm. five or whatever. That's all you knew. And so one at one point, the shift coordinator wanted to know, is this doing what it's meant to be doing? And I was like, I can't tell you. I don't know what's in this. Um, the numbers are going up. I'm assuming it's doing the right thing. So, yeah, even at that stage, even people who were working on console at the time had no idea what the observations were. And so it was a surprise to me on the, the data release, the very first data release day, what these actually were. That's incredible to think that even the science teams were just as in the dark as as the rest of us. So, yeah, I mean, do you, the question now is once now you've got all these images that you've applied for and everything, like uh, what now? Because obviously, we know that the images come down off the telescope as sort of their raw format, and obviously, I guess it's going to be a lot of processing. And good science takes time and all that. But what's sort of the plan going forward? Well, we submitted a paper yesterday. Um, <laughs> on uh, on one of our very very beautiful data sets so I think that's going to be a nice uh, I think that may be everyone's favorite image for a day um for JWST <laughs> um so I'm, I'm looking forward to when that actually we get the referee report back and actually have that published because that's not we've not put that on archive yet or anywhere it's basically we've kept it to ourselves uh, I think that's about the first proper science paper we've written so far as a team. I think there's a few, there's drafts now coming out that we're we're in the process of and writing up some calibration and some of the actual nuances of science that I think various different science teams need. And then I I don't know, I'm trying to probably want to publish about a paper a week. I don't think I'll be able to (laughs) write enough science to keep up with it. It, I've got so much stunning data and it's, I'm like a kid in a candy store playing with it and I want to work on it all at once. And then, Okay, I've got a new shiny laptop to try and process things a bit faster. I just I'm making beautiful images all the time and beautiful spectra and looking at and new lines that we've not seen before. And it's just like, wow. <laughs> and then now it's a case of I think I'm having to learn about five PhDs at once to do science that has never been done before um, or in very different situations. So even though I've worked in the infrared for a very long time, um, we don't have the tools for some of this. It's like, oh, we didn't think this was possible. So the tools just don't exist to do the analysis. Um, so that's um, so like that, relearning everything you thought you knew or just yeah or just how faint we're going um so mm. I'm used to looking at sort of I look at a lot of evolved stars and then we cut off with what what we previously did now I'm going about eight or nine ten magnitudes below what I'm used to seeing and I'm just like what are these bumps what what are these and it's like is this the main sequence turn on what 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 a main what sequence that? turn on rather than a main sequence turn off yes Yes. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're seeing all these things, and I'm just like, I've never seen this before. How would you, especially not in the mid infrared? Or yeah, it's 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 learning. Like, how do we deal with this data now? That that's I think the next stage after we made these very first look and, and quick data. It's mm-hmm. oh wow, <laughs> this can tell us a lot more than what we thought it can. How do we do this analysis? It's just wonderful. It really is. And I, I really can't wait to see the full array of actual process journal accepted articles that have been fully calibrated. I think yeah. that's my next moment of wonder to enjoy reading those. And I don't think I'll have enough reading time to get through anywhere close to how many uh, JWST papers are going to come out in the next year. Well, I think for now, we're all happy to just drool at the images and wait very patiently for all those journal articles to come out, hopefully very soon. <laughs> A huge thank you to Dr. Libby Jones for taking the time out of her day to chat to all of us. That was actually an edited version of our chat if you want to see the full length chat that will be out on this channel in a couple of days. If you want to see more videos like this chatting to some of my colleagues that are working with JWST, hit that like button and let me know down in the comments below. Also, before we get to the bloopers, a huge thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video.
Brilliant is a STEM learning platform with interactive and engaging courses across science, maths, and computer science topics for whatever you're interested in. With new content added every single month, you can learn at your own pace. Even learning just that little bit every day can have a huge impact. Now, controlling a telescope either in space or on the ground, or even processing and analyzing the data you get from telescopes once the observing is done, is all done with code. In fact, if there's any budding scientists out there, my advice is always the same. It's to learn how to code. You can do just that with Brilliant. I love their programming with Python course because it starts right from the basics and takes you through all the key tools in a really accessible way with the input for the code right there in Brilliant's interactive window. So if that sounds like something you'd be up for, to sign up completely for free, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on that link in the video description down below. And the first 200 people are going to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and supporting this channel. And now, roll those bloopers. All right, okay, I've just got to record. It's just this little short introduction, so we can probably smash through it. Come on, Becky, no mistakes. We're gonna have no bloopers. I should not have said that, should I? I should not have said that. <laughs> All those members of the science teams that have been like sworn to secrecy, sworn to secrecy, sworn to secrecy. No mistake. What did I say? Mary itself has to be cooled to a toasty seven Kelvin. That's just seven. Did I say toasty? A toasty seven Kelvin. A chilly seven Kelvin. Oh my god, I jinxed it. I jinxed it so much. Seriously, since I had my chat to Libby, all I can picture is like these people like sat at this big fancy like NASA control room with like big joysticks and just hearing kind of like the Mario Kart music in the background, like it's like do 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 like I don't know why. It's clearly not what happens. I know that's not what happens, but it's all I can picture in my head now. I almost want to like make it a thing, like edit it so it is a thing with the music playing in the background. <laughs>